household air pollution remains one of the world's greatest environmental health challenges. Responsible for some 3 million deaths each year from respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, stroke and cancer in adults, and pneumonia in children. I'm Gavin Freeborn, and this is Original Ideas, a brand new podcast from the University of Liverpool. In this series, we're going to explore academic research and the effect it has on the wider world. Why is it so important that we invest in research and how will research that's happening right now benefit wider society in the future? In this first episode, we're starting by looking at the one thing all around us, air. About 3 billion people continue to use smoky, polluting stoves and fuels inside their homes for cooking and heating. Our latest estimates are that up to one third of deaths from heart attack, stroke, lung cancer and chronic respiratory disease are due to air pollution. Those are the words of the Director General of the World Health Organization, highlighting the fact that every year, billions of people rely on polluting solid fuels or kerosene for cooking and heating their homes. Research has shown a link to this and devastating illnesses, an increased risk of pneumonia in children under five and respiratory and cardiovascular diseases in adults. And this isn't just a third world problem. In the UK, around 160,000 people a year receive an asthma diagnosis. In some parts of the UK, air quality is linked to 33% of childhood asthma cases. So how can we drive better, clean air for all of us? And what role can research play to help us get there? This is Original Ideas. I'd like to invite you all to take a deep breath in. I'm now going to tell you that that breath contained hundreds of tiny air pollution particles called particulate matter. PM are tiny, and yet they're known to cause or worsen illnesses like cardiovascular disease and asthma. And they've even been linked to Alzheimer's and cancer. So they're serious stuff. That's Chloe Gray, a PhD student from the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Liverpool. Chloe is currently undertaking research around the sources of particle matter in polluted air and we'll meet Chloe later in this episode to look at that. However, first, let me introduce Professor Daniel Pope. Daniel is a Professor of Global Public Health and Epidemiology at the University of Liverpool. For over 25 years, he's researched the health, environment and climate impacts from polluting sources of household energy in lower and middle income countries. Dan currently directs the multi-country NIHR Global Health Research Unit Clean Air Africa project that works on changing the link between disease and household air pollution. I spoke with Dan to find out more about the project, the impacts of air pollution globally and what's needed to drive forward cleaner fuels, cleaner energy and cleaner air. So Dan, Clean Air Africa project, how did you become involved in it? Well, Cleaner Africa was launched in 2018 as a global health research group. We received £3 million specifically to address the burden of disease from household air pollution in sub-Saharan Africa. The region itself has 900 million people reliant on solid fuels and kerosene for household energy. And it's estimated that this exposure to household air pollution from this reliance is associated with 700,000 premature deaths each year from exposure to household air pollution. So the group was a partnership between research institutions in Ghana, Kenya and Cameroon, led by the University of Liverpool, with the remit to scale adoption of clean cooking in households and schools in our focus countries. In the four years of funding, we developed instrumental programmes addressing the barriers and the enablers to adoption and sustained use of clean cooking. The Cleaner Africa Global Health Research Unit is now a successful collaboration of seven research institutions in five sub-Saharan African countries, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania and also Cameroon. So tell us about the training that you have created and how that works and, and how that's spread out across the country of Kenya and touching the 51 million people there. Yeah, so in 2018, when we started scoping work for for Cleaner Africa, we were taken to the Ministry of Health and I met Dr James Matari, who at the time was the Director of Public Health 
And he implored us in whatever we were going to do in terms of research around household air pollution, that we should focus on developing a module for their new community health worker training curricula. So we turned that into a major work stream for us based on our 20 or 30 years worth of research, put together a comprehensive training module in raising the awareness of household air pollution at a community level, but also strategies around primary and secondary prevention of household air pollution. We also developed job aids, which are basically a flip chart of illustrations, photographs, small amounts of text that the community health workers can use to explain this quite difficult uh, messaging around uh, the issues of household air pollution to their households. After a year, we did some extensive piloting with the WHO, who were very enthusiastic about this training programme, and Kenya officially ratified that module into the training curricula for the Ministry of Health. There was a grand launch in November 2021. On the back of that, it was suddenly rolled out across 17 counties. Now, Kenya is devolved with 47 counties. Since that time, we've helped the ministry train community health workers across all 47 counties. So the messaging from this training programme in prevention of household air pollution will effectively reach all 51 million Kenyans because each community health promoter is responsible for 200 or so households in Kenya. So we're very excited about this as being a a fantastic population public health approach and we're taking it to our other focus countries in Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania and Cameroon. So when you actually got on the ground in Kenya and you went along to one of the schools to observe the fossil fuels being burned and the smoke being generated and the damage that was being done to the ladies who were cooking. Tell us about that experience and what you learned. So this would have been about 2019. We wanted to carry out pilot work in schools that relied on wood and charcoal for cooking to document sort of levels of air pollution you get in kitchens and in classrooms and in the playground, but also what sort of levels of air pollution were the cooks themselves breathing in when they are um, lighting the fuel to cook the meals for the kids. So we were introduced to the head teacher. Her name was Lena Karayuki, and this was in an informal settlement in Makuru, which is one of the largest uh, slums in Africa. And Lena, who now has become a friend to the programme, really, she's one of our key advisors to a lot of what we do with our school's work, just took us around the Kwanjenga Primary School to show us what the issues were from reliance on wood for cooking. And it was really humbling to see how this impacted not just the school itself or the cooks, uh, but the whole environment. They were cooking githeri at the time that we were being shown around, a mixture of beans and maize that's cooked in very big pots and takes a lot of wood to heat up and it takes a lot of duration to cook. And the smoke I could see in the playground was thick and the kids were playing and you couldn't really see them across the playground. And Lena was explaining to us that this is a daily occurrence. They're totally used to the smoke and she was saying that isn't anything. She said what she really worries about are the cooks who turn up and they're in an enclosed kitchen and spend all day there with these really high levels of air pollution. She gives them milk every day, feeling that that will help uh, protect their lungs from breathing in the smoke. And we just thought this is such a big health hazard that needs to be documented and needs to be part of our research to encourage a transitional switch to clean cooking. We learned that the levels of particulate matter, this is respirable particulate matter, particularly damaging for health because it's breathed really deep into the lungs and it can cross into the bloodstream and cause systemic effects. The levels in the playground were maybe 20 times the safe levels or the guideline levels for health by WHO. Levels in the classrooms, slightly higher. And levels in the kitchen were sky high, 100 times higher. And the cook's levels were just over half those levels that were seen in the kitchen. So huge amounts of health damaging pollution breathed in by the cooks. We spoke to the cooks about how they experienced this and and what it meant for their health. They told us that it affects their eyes, it affects their breathing, 
it gives them headaches and they try and avoid the smoke as much as they can but it, the nature of the work dictates they have to be in that environment the whole time and you could see the distress that the cooks were, were clearly under whilst they were cooking. So the smoke is that intense, such, such a hazardous work environment that um, yeah, there's some really sad stories from that school. Yeah, the research shows it's equivalent to smoking 400 cigarettes in yeah. a day. And that's a, a small standard um, three stone open fire that households will use. These industrial pots for cooking for all those kids, the levels are just through the roof. When I was interviewing one of the, the cooks um, or stood there while she was being interviewed, I couldn't stay there more than a minute to listen to the interview. My eyes were streaming. I was finding it hard to breathe. In fact, you'll see from our documentary that when I'm talking to the head teacher, I'm finding it very hard to, to be in that environment. Um, but you can imagine, you know, 10 years of that exposure, what it's going to do to the cooks. So it's, it's awful, really. And we heard some very humbling stories from that school. We heard uh, uh, about the kids' nutrition for the schools. So in this um, very difficult environment in Makuru, so in, the, in this slum setting, there's very, very little money. So the kids will turn up to school if there's a meal to be had. If there's no food, they won't turn up. So cooking is an essential part of the functioning of the school in terms of education. If the wood supply doesn't turn up on time and they can't cook, the kids don't turn up. If the wood gets delivered and it's wet, it creates more smoke, it takes longer to cook and it causes problems for getting the meals ready in time. The kids don't hang around. We interviewed the kids as well as part of our research and we found out that they're absolutely starving when they come to school but they still, when they're served their food, their bowl of beans and githeri, they'll cut it in half to take half back to their siblings at home because their siblings are starving, they haven't got any food at home at all. So it's an unbelievably difficult um, environment and situation, all centred around cooking. So it was very, very humbling for us as researchers. Yeah, truly heartbreaking when we think of when we go to the kitchen to put something in the oven and we don't have the same incredible life and death risk. It's true. And the children don't even perceive that risk. They're children. So they come and play, they sing, they dance. I mean, very humbling. And tell us about the goals of Clean Air Africa and how research ties into these goals. Our research agenda is very much aligned with recommendations from the WHO Air Quality Guidelines and also the UN Sustainable Development Goal Framework. For example, we work with the ministries of health, infrastructure, education, energy, to ensure our research evidence generates as much impact as possible and can really make a difference to, to policies. In Kenya, we're working with the Office of the First Lady as she's championing our national program of health system strengthening for prevention of household air pollution. And uh, over the next year or so, we're hoping to train 100,000 community health promoters and 310,000 women from women's groups in Kenya in prevention of household air pollution related disease. To support our research activities, we've also established an air pollution centre of excellence in Nairobi. The centre itself houses Africa's first gravimetric filter processing robot. And this allows us to rapidly and accurately assess air pollution samples that have been taken from across sub-Saharan Africa. Before the centre was actually opened, samples needed to be shipped off to the US, processed, sent back, and that was a source of potential error, but also incredibly costly. So the centre now can be used at a much more cost-effective rate and become a resource for sub-Saharan Africa. The centre also, of course, includes state-of-the-art air pollution monitoring equipment for measuring uh, particulate matter, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxides and, and black carbon. So basically the pollutants that are, are damaging to both health and also to the climate. So you've said out there that there seems to be a lot of progress around air quality in low to middle income countries. So what are your hopes for the future and where do you see more research in the future helping? In our sector, uh, I guess the International Energy Agency is the authority on extrapolating evidence to inform policy on scale of clean energy in low middle income countries and also beyond. And last month, the IEA 
published a, a vision for clean cooking access for all. And this was a, a substantive report based on a comprehensive uh, systematic analysis of how Sub-Saharan Africa could move towards SDG 7 by 2030. The report clearly laid out the necessity for households needing to be using LPG for clean cooking in the region by 2030. And this is compared to 12% of households using electricity and the rest using a combination of improved cook stoves, alcohol fuels and, and biogas. The evidence is critical because for advocacy in relation to public health, there's an imperative to scale clean cooking by 2030, taking into consideration the need for uh, LPG as a clean cooking fuel. Instead of waiting for Africa to sort of leapfrog, I guess, from polluting biomass fuels to renewable electricity by 2050 or even later. Whilst this advocacy is important for ensuring the targeting of resource from development organisations in the West to support the Global South address critical climate and health priorities, Cleaner Africa is going to continue to document the positive health, gender equality, education and environmental impacts that can be achieved through programmatic scale of clean cooking in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you, um, Dan. It's been really great to meet you and hear about Clean Air Africa and the great work that you and your colleagues are doing. It's great to see you working on changing the world for the better. Thanks again to Professor Dan Pope. Fascinating to hear about the research taking place through the Clean Air Africa project. And I think it just shows the power of research and how it can impact and change the quality of life for so many people around the world. So Dan's work gives us a very global perspective of air pollution. Now let's look closer to home. Here in the UK, there are a variety of programmes and research projects taking place to examine the impact of air pollution and how we can drive improvements in the air we breathe. Chloe Gray is a PhD student at the University of Liverpool and is currently undertaking research into particle matter in our air. Earlier this year, Chloe won the People's Choice Award in the University of Liverpool's three-minute thesis competition for her research presentation to improve the monitoring of air pollution. I talked with Chloe to discuss her work and where she hopes it will lead in the future. So welcome, Chloe. Thank you. Just before we talk about your current research, I know that you've got a background in chemistry mm -hmm. and a degree in chemistry. What made you want to step into research following your degree? Yeah, so after doing my chemistry degree in Liverpool, I actually worked for a bit in industry. So I was like a research and development chemist for a while. But I kind of always, I don't know, I had this underlying feeling that like I wanted a bit more freedom in terms of the projects I worked on and what I did within those projects and kind of wanted to be able to explore the things that interested me that might not have suited industry. With that in mind, I felt like a PhD was the perfect opportunity and then one that would kind of combine my chemistry experience with my like personal values around like, the environment and climate and things. And I think I seem to have found a good one that kind of combines all those bits together. And with your current work, can you tell us more about this research and, and what you've been looking at? Yeah, OK. So... My PhD looks at a type of air pollution called particulate matter. So that's basically anything that's a solid or liquid particle suspended in the air. So that basically means that I don't look at anything gaseous. So you might have heard of like sulfur dioxides or NOx, but I don't look at any of that. It's purely the solid and liquid particles. And as for the last year, I've been collecting data from a big network of low cost pollution sensors in Liverpool. And I'm now kind of working to calibrate all of those sensors and all of that data so we can ensure it's of like the highest quality possible. So that's been a long time in the making and I'm just coming towards the end of that little bit of work almost. And then in the next few months, I'm kind of going to use that data that's been calibrated to actually identify what the main sources of pollution are in Liverpool with the long term future hopeful goal of actually tracking pollution from its source to where it ends up. Can you give us an example of where the pollution is coming from mm -hmm. in Liverpool and how that's affecting people on a day to day? Yeah, sure. In Liverpool, the main source of particulates is going to be from traffic, cars, buses, lorries, that kind of stuff. But you do also get a fair amount of pollution from 
burning at home, so if it's like log burners, like they're much more popular nowadays, or like you see a lot from the industry as well. So down kind of Widnes and Warrington Way, there's like glass manufacturers, and some of that ends up getting carried all the way into Liverpool. So you might not even notice it. Like you're walking along the street and it might seem perfectly fine to you, but you're constantly breathing these particulates in, like you're doing it when you're walking to work, when you walk your kids to school, when you go to the shop, even inside, like it's present because it gets carried in from the outside through doors or through windows, but then also things inside the home or inside the workplace also give off their own particulates. So you can't tell, but it is everywhere. And the sad thing is that if you're constantly exposed to it, especially at higher levels, it can lead to kind of adverse health outcomes, which is like one of the main reasons people want to study it. And can you give us some examples of those adverse health outcomes? I kind of guess the main ones are cardiovascular disease, so like your heart disease and stroke, that kind of stuff, Um, respiratory illnesses like asthma. And then there's also recently been work done to kind of show the link between PM exposure and getting lung cancer. So they they are scary and they do have real world impacts on people. So walking up the street, Mm -hmm. people are breathing in the fumes and it potentially leads to these diseases. Yeah, especially if you're doing it day in, day out. And if you're already kind of predisposed to having asthma, it's going to make it worse. Or if you're young or if you're really old, like you're going to be more affected. And can you tell us what made you focus on this area of research and how bad is it as a problem in the UK? Yeah, so initially I was interested in atmospheric chemistry as a whole, but the more I kind of read about it and the more I dug into air pollution, I realised it's not just a problem that we face in terms of the environment and the climate, it's actually like a big human health problem. So that kind of sold the air pollution idea to me and then in terms of how bad it is in the UK like it's present like it is there but when you compare it to countries like India or Pakistan or China like we're doing a lot better so I checked this morning I checked the air quality levels in London Delhi in India and then um, Lahore in Pakistan and if I remember rightly, London was just at the limit for the World Health Organization guidelines for particulate matter. So that was five micrograms per meter cube. So not not doing great, but not way over the limit or anything. Delhi, I think it was in India, was like 40 times higher than the limit set by the World Health Organization. And then the city Lahore in Pakistan was 72 times higher. So like that just really highlights that it is a problem in the UK, but it's way worse in kind of low to middle income countries and 90% of premature deaths from air pollution exposure are actually happening in the low to middle income countries so like it's it's a big deal and it kind of makes you think well why the UK then because we're doing okay compared to these other countries but in my head I see using the UK as a case study where we can afford to kind of test these things out test out how successful these low cost sensors are here and then basically apply our findings to these poorer countries that need it more than we do. I want to prove that they work here so then governments or even just like citizen scientists in other countries that are kind of traditionally lacking in their air quality monitoring will be like convinced to take it up and and buy a few sensors where they might have had none. Could you just explain about the low cost sensors, Mm -hmm. how you set them up and where you set them up? Yeah, so... They're called low cost because they're cheaper than what you might find the government using or universities using. So those sensors are kind of tens of thousands of pounds. They're really expensive and typically only one is put in an entire city. But the sensors that I'm using, they're like between 10 and 200 pounds. Like they're really cheap. And then what we've done is kind of put them into a waterproof box with a solar panel so they kind of don't need charging or anything and they have wireless communication so they're kind of good to go. We just get the data sent to us. And in terms of where they are in Liverpool, they are literally all over the place. Like we've got them as far north as Bootle, right down to like Speak pretty much. And then Toxteth, Sefton Park, we're all around the city centre. So yeah, we've got loads. We've got like 34 or 35 census or something so we've got mm. pretty good coverage and um do you have an aim or a goal for your research and the outcome of your phd or something that you want to achieve 
or change before you finish it? I think, yeah, the idea around proving to people or convincing people that low-cost sensors are a valid way to collect air pollution data, especially when you can't afford a really expensive one. Like, okay, the low-cost sensors are never going to be quite as good as the really expensive ones. We acknowledge that, but it's better than not having anything. So if I could kind of change the narrative around them a little bit, that would be nice to be able to show that, like, they're good enough, essentially. And another thing which is kind of separate from the sensors is I would like, again, to be able to convince people that the way we measure particulate matter at the moment isn't quite fit for purpose. So we measure micrograms per meter cubed of air pollution. So that's essentially how much mass of these particles is in any given air sample. It does work, but it's a bit biased towards the really big, heavy particles because the smaller ones just, they're tiny, they don't weigh much, but there's more of the tiny stuff. So if you look at the size of all the particles in a sample, You'll have hundreds, if not thousands, of the really tiny stuff, but then you might have tens or a few really big ones, but it's those big ones that are kind of skewing the measurement that we currently use. Arguably, that's not right because those bigger ones cause less damage. It's the smaller ones that actually cause all of those health issues that I mentioned earlier. For you personally, where do you see your research work taking you in the future? Um, I think ideally I'd love to be able to influence policy, so... The idea around looking at the number of particles in the air rather than the mass of particles in the air. If I could persuade somebody in DEFRA that has all the power that that is a great way of of measuring the concentration of particulate matter, that would be amazing. But if not that, I think it would be quite nice to go to places and like inspire people to create their own network of air quality sensors and start collecting their own data and maybe creating a repository of all this data so it's open for people to use because there's a few data sets that exist but I think a huge comprehensive one that covers entire cities would be like the ideal situation. It's all about isn't it like generating evidence enough evidence that's of sufficient quality to kind of the government can't really say no in a way like it's all there for them. Yeah I think so 100% and some of the things that are happening obviously the trains have been electrified Mm -hmm. with Mersey Rail they're working on you know some new hydrogen buses. We are getting there slowly. Thank you for your time today it's been really great to meet you. Oh thank you as well yeah I've enjoyed it it's been good. (laughs) Yeah you're very welcome and good luck with the rest of the PhD and do stay in touch. Yeah I will thanks. So that brings us to the close of this first episode of Original Ideas, looking at the University of Liverpool's research and its real-world impact. This was a wonderful episode to start us off, looking at air pollution around the world through some fascinating and powerful insights. Find out more about these and many other important life-changing projects at liverpool.ac.uk forward slash research, where we also invite you to sign up for our monthly research newsletter, which includes updates on events, news, fantastic opportunities to work with us, and much more. And please do follow or subscribe on whatever platform you listen on so you can catch new episodes when they're released. Thanks for listening to Original Ideas. We look forward to connecting with you again soon.